Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. I have read this scripture at least 10 times, once to begin every message of this series, and at least one other time in, in, in two different parts of the series. And, and I'm wondering in those 10 times, have you stopped to think, what are those good things? What are those good things that God has planned for me? Ask your neighbor, what are those good things God has planned for me? I believe that God has some watch this moments for each of you. He has watched this moments for me. And it's things he's planned long ago. Moments where he will be glorified through you, glorified through me. I believe that with all my heart. And so today I'm going to continue this watch, this series. And I'm preaching from a title that will not make sense for a good bit of this message. At the very end, hopefully it all comes together. So I pray that you stick with me till then. But I'm preaching from the title, Cast the Bait. Cast the Bait. So right now, let's, let's pray in this place and let's ask God to show up in a mighty way. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you'll anoint this word, that you'll anoint our ears to hear God, our, our ears to understand, Lord. I pray that you'll anoint me to preach this word as you've laid it on my heart. I pray in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen. 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 You may be seated. I've got a, an, a question that requires honesty. Have you ever just felt like you're doing too much? Any hands? Any hands in the room? Come on now. You can, you can be honest. You just, you've been a little too busy doing too many activities, too many projects. Come on. Some of y'all know where I'm, where I'm at with that one. We, we feel that at times. A couple days ago, Jen and I were, were sitting down having a little coffee, taking a look, just a break in, the, in, the, in that morning. And uh, we both stay real busy and we work real hard. And our strategy to not burn out and fall apart, which we would do, is that we try to stop the chaos at least for small moments during the days, but, but, but at least also for big moments, about three or four times a year. We try to stop the chaos, and we take a break. And, and, and so we were talking about our next break that we, we know we need. And, 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 and first off, I want to tell the husbands and wives in this room, if you want to keep your marriage healthy, or perhaps make your marriage healthy, you need to have some conversations like that about burnout and about about doing too much and support each other in those conversations if your spouse says i think we need to take a few days and take a break from all the chaos i want to tell you learn how to not turn that into an argument about how it's inconvenient right now learn how to not make excuses about that go ahead and have the conversation because we all need to take moments together and take a break there's a reset that can change your life. There's, there's some refreshes that can change your marriage and strengthen your marriage. It can make a big difference in your family and in your life and in your marriage. So with that being said, Jen and I regularly pause and, and have these conversations. And, 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 and just a couple days ago, we were discussing what we want to do the next time we take a break, where we'd like to go. And, and, and Jen said she wanted to visit some place that has a lot of unique land. And, and so we talked about the deserts of, of Arizona, and we, we talked about the mountains of Tennessee, and we talked about the diverse landscape in, in New Mexico, and, and we talked about hill country of, 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 of central Texas around Austin area. We considered even the canyons of Colorado, and we're talking about unique landscapes, and it hit me sitting there that every place we discussed, we were more concerned with its identifying factors than their location it was at. We were more concerned with the identifying factors of that place and that land than the distance it was from where we were, from where we are right now, and even the cost it would take to get there. Nothing was entering our conversation but the identifying factors of specific areas. Now, as many of you know, uh, I travel a lot, and, and in the past, I've really traveled a lot uh, for work reasons and stuff like that. And, and because the team that I would normally travel with is based in Nashville, everywhere that I would travel, the assumption was always that I am from Nashville, and then they would hear me speak, and they would ask me where I'm from. So there was, 
there was always like this, something's weird, this is not quite the same. And I, I would always tell them, I, I'm from Louisiana. And, and sometimes the conversation stopped, but depending on where we were, and it, it was a good conversation, inevitably the next question is, well, where in Louisiana? And, and I would say a little town called Church Point, and then I would start talking about where the interstates intersect, and I would talk about the Acadiana region. And, and, and from there, questions always begin. Well, what is there to do in Louisiana? What is Louisiana known for? What is unique about this Acadiana area? And in other words, what are the identifying factors of where you live? I always start with the basics because normally they're expecting the basics. I'll say, well, as you well know, Louisiana is the sportsman's paradise. And then I become a walking postcard for my home state. I say things like, it is known for its many bayou swamps and coastal marshes. The land is tailor-made for excellent fishing. The forests across our state from the north to the south provide opportunities for hunting squirrels and, and rabbit and deer and, and hogs and turkey. And, and, and the waterways are excellent for duck hunting. And the fields are great for dove hunting. And it's a sportsman's paradise. If they want more detail, I can tell them more detail. I can tell them that the, the bass fishing industry is a multi-million dollar industry in Louisiana. In fact, I can tell them people travel all over the place to come to the Gulf, to Grand Isle or Venice, to, to fish in the Gulf, and they charter, they charter boats year-round from there. It's the sportsman's paradise. And of course, anytime I go into postcard mode, it brings the next question, so are you big into hunting and fishing? And that's where it gets a little weird because my standard answer is, well, when I was young, I used to fish with my grandma and grandpa in my backyard. And that's about my limit of fishing. I enjoyed it, but that's about all I know about it. And then, and then when I was a little older, I would hunt with my dad, and I enjoyed it, but, but that's about all, all I know about it. I killed a couple deer. That's about, that's about my, 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 I have one, one mount. That's it. But as I've gotten older, I have to tell them I no longer fish in, in, or hunt very often. And I'm hoping that, Lord, help me, it'll change one day. But, but I always then move to the second identifying factor of Louisiana. And that we're known for our food, brother. We're known for it. And if it's an extended conversation, I can tell them all about boiled crawfish. Just so you know, I'm obsessed with boiled crawfish. I can eat crawfish anytime, anywhere. I wanted to call Jonathan and get his little poem he wrote about gumbo and just use it again about crawfish. Like, I'm telling you, I, I talk, I love some crawfish, but I'll tell them all about crawfish. I'll tell them about gumbo. I'll tell them about etouffee. I'll explain what etouffee is. I talk about sauce piquant. I talk about red beans and rice with fried catfish on top. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And if the conversation is going really well or I'm really hungry, one of the two or maybe both, I begin talking about my my favorite fried fish, sakale or, or white perch or, or whatever you want to call them these days. But I reminisce about times growing up, we would go to the John Fala's house for a fish fry. And Sister Shirley would fry sakale and make this amazing fish dip that, that was a lot like crawfish dip, but it was different and perfect for sakale. It was just, it was good times here in Louisiana. Talking about things that identify us. And in like manner, in life, we all have things that identify us, actions that others use around us to identify who we are, identify our priorities, identify our character. I'm going to say it plainly. What we do identifies us far more than what we say. You see, I can say Louisiana is sportsman's paradise because that's what we are most known by. But the real passion shows up when I start talking about the food of Louisiana because that's something I partake of regularly. If my friend Josh Crater and I were to take out our photo reels of our phones right now and have you scan through them on Josh's phone, I guarantee you that there is a pic in the picture reel, there's going to be, it's going to be filled with ducks from the last duck hunt, deer from the previous deer season, hopefully just the previous deer season, fish from the last fishing trip, maybe some doves or some squirrels. If you were to look at mine, you're going to see pictures of boiled crawfish, fried oysters, shrimp and tasso Heineken, wood grilled red snapper with lump crab meat on top, perhaps some bread pudding, and for sure some tacos and random picks of lattes with latte art. That's what you're going to find all over my reels. You will be able to identify our passion by the pictures on our phone reel. Because what we do is an identifying factor. In fact, I want to say it this way. 
It's far, it's way easier to identify someone from what they do than from what they say they do. We live in a world that says a lot of things. But often what people say and what people do are very different. And this practice isn't regulated to our current generation. Jesus, Jesus faced the same thing, and he made it plain when he confronted the priest in the temple in Matthew 23 and 27. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within, full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanliness. You see, the priest of that day said one thing, but they were doing another thing. You appear beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, you're unclean. You're stopping people from getting to God. It, it, on the inside, you're not what you say you are. In Mark 7, Jesus says it this way. He says, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In other words, they were saying one thing, but their actions didn't back up their words. I need you to see this today. The Bible states it plainly in 1 John 4 and 20. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. See, you can claim you are one thing, but if your actions don't back it up, you're a liar. You can say you love God, but if your actions don't show it, the Bible says you're a liar. What I'm trying to show you today is simple. The identifying factors are not what we say. It's what we do. Society has made it easy to claim one thing, but do another. And this is for all of us. I, I don't want you to, to think I'm, I'm pointing anyone out. None of us are innocent. I can likely hit you with, let me read you three statements, and I'm probably going to throw that out there and hit 80 to 90% of us. Have you ever fussed your kids for having too much screen time, only to check your own and find out you average an hour more a day than they do? Oh, well, I'm just reading my Bible. Really? <laughs> Better check yourself. Have you ever celebrated your new exercise and healthy eating routine by having a 700-calorie smoothie as a snack? <laughs> healthy 44-ounce Smoothie King angel food cake, 700 calories, being healthy, midday snack. Maybe that's not real enough for you. Let me get even more, more in the weeds. Have you ever celebrated your health by getting the grilled chicken nuggets from Chick-fil-A and then downing them with three packs of Chick-fil-A sauce at 140 calories per pack? Oh, way too real. My favorite, this is, this is one we all see all the time, where you get the supersized Big Mac meal and then you get the Diet Coke to cut the calories out. Saying one thing, doing another. I would, would take it to even more serious note, though. Have you ever claimed God is number one in your life, but decided to sleep in on Sunday because you stayed out too late on Saturday with your friends? Is he number one? On the day we have set aside to worship him and praise him, the day we have the opportunity to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, shouldn't this be the day you most look forward to if he's number one? Actions speak louder, far louder than words. But society has made it easy for everyone to be a little hypocritical. See, we can post our words on Facebook. We can stage, stage a good story on Instagram. All with the goal to make it look like one thing when in reality it's something totally different. Listen to me today. No matter what society may lead you to believe, it is not enough to just say who you are. You have to be who you are. You have to be who you are. I said this last week and it still applies. What you do flows directly from who you are. That's how this works. James said it this way in James 2 and 18. Now, someone may argue some people have faith. 
others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. In other words, because of who I am, I am going to do good deeds. You won't have to wonder if I'm a hypocrite. You won't have to wonder if I really love Jesus. You will see who I am by what I do. Identifying factors. I was reading the other day about the difference between branding and marketing, and, it, and, it, and the article made it so clear that there's such a difference. Branding is who you are. Marketing builds awareness about what you do. In recent years, with the abundance of information available to society, some corporations in, 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 in the world have found themselves in trouble based on things they do. We've all read about technology companies uh, bidding out their manufacturing to countries that use labor that the U.S. would consider illegal and immoral. We have heard stories of shoe companies doing the same thing, bidding out labor into countries that we would think that it's the wrong thing to do. And that's just two simple examples. And the initial response of those companies as that started happening, uh, in, in, in with other com companies as well, were, was they would adjust their marketing to tell the public who they were. So instead of focusing on their products, suddenly you would see commercials about this, this company and they would try to tell them who they were and how they help people and, 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 and how, and how they, they do all these great things. Instead of talking about how their products improve daily life or maybe how their product is better than the competitor, they instead spending countless dollars trying to define through marketing who they were. But what they found out is it didn't matter to the public. In fact, until they begin making steps in actually changing what they do, simply telling the public who they were didn't make a difference. The words weren't hitting home, but their actions did. And what, I, what, 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 I, what this means and what I'm trying to tell you is you can try to brand yourself all you want. You can put your best foot forward on social media. You can make every picture that is posted of you have the perfect pose. You can protect the brand of who you are using every metric and tool you can find. But at the end of the day, it matters what you do more than what you say. If you say you love others, but you gossip and backbite, your actions are speaking louder. If you say you follow Jesus, but you act and look like the devil, your actions are speaking louder. If you say the kingdom of God is first in your life, but your treasure and your time says differently, your actions are speaking louder. If you say you love your family, but all your time and treasure goes to your own personal hobbies, your actions are speaking louder. I'm trying to tell you what we do is the identifying factor of who we are. It's the truth. I want to show you something in the scriptures. When I look at the book of Acts, I can find the identity of the church by looking at what they did. The Bible says in Acts 2 that on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. From the very beginning, what separated the New Testament church was the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. It was an identifying factor. It was something that was different than ever before. The New Testament church didn't just say, hey, we're different. Things happened with them that were different. I'm talking about identifying factors. The next thing I find in the book of Acts is Peter preaching the gospel to everyone who showed up to see what was going on in that upper room. In Acts 2, verse 14 through 36, Peter tells the people who Jesus is, that he died and he rose again, and that Jesus is beyond all doubt the Messiah. And then we get to verse 37. And the Bible says, Peter's words pierced their heart. And they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. 
I want to say that again. The promises to you, to your children, and to all those that are far away. In other words, this will forever be known as an identifying factor of the New Testament church. Forever known. Forever known. Verse 40 says, Then Peter continued preaching for a long time. I often wonder what a long time meant. <laughs> Strongly urging all of his listeners, save yourself from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and were added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Those who believed. Listen to me carefully. One of the identifying factors of the book of Acts church was they went beyond just words. They were not like the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law. They didn't say one thing with their words and another thing with their actions. See, it's popular in churches these days to stop at just the words. Simply saying, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. I believe he's my Lord and Savior. But what I want you to see today is you have to go beyond just saying it. You have to do some things. The identifying factor of the New Testament church didn't stop at words. Those who believe all the things Peter said, not those who believe bits and pieces of what Peter said, but those who believe what Peter said in its entirety put action to their words. The Bible said they were baptized and added to the church that day. I'm talking about identifying factors of the early church. And I'm, I will echo some thoughts in the room that immediately probably cropped up. Well, pastor, that's just one example. A pattern takes more than one. In fact, I wouldn't call it a pattern until there's three. Me either. So we're on the same page. But you see, I see it happen again in Acts 8. A believer by the name of Philip found himself on a desert road uh, that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza, and he met the treasure of Ethiopia. And the man was reading scripture and looking for understanding. And in Acts 8 and 35, we, we read, it says, beginning with the same scripture, Philip showed up and he began to explain what the guy was reading. And Philip told him the good news about Jesus. Philip preached the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And they rode along. They came to some water. And the Enoch said, look, there's some water. Can, can I put action to the words that I just heard? Can I put action to the words that I now believe? Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? And so he ordered the carriage to stop. And they went down into the water. And Philip baptized them. Talking about putting action to the words. I'm talking about identifying factors of the New Testament church. In the book of Acts chapter 10, we find Peter preaching Jesus to, to, the, to the Gentiles, and he teaches them this precious gospel message that we so love. And the Bible says in verse 44, even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. Why? Because they said it? No, because they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. They saw action to the words. They saw action to what they said. I'm talking about identifying factors. Then Peter asked, can anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Identifying factors. I know I've already given you three examples. We've already established a pattern, but why stop at three when I can go to four? In Acts 19, we see Peter, uh, we see Paul speaking to what the NLT version calls believers. In Acts 19 and 2, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? In other words, when you, when you believed the words, did you have an action that followed it? I know what you say you do. I know, I know you say you believe, but what identifying factors exist within you? And they said, no, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. You see, there was a knowledge gap that was, that was stopping them from experiencing the fullness of Jesus in their life. 
And so he asked them, what baptism did you experience? And they replied, the baptism of John. And Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. And as soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on him, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied, identifying factors of the New Testament church. See, I've just shown you four examples of the same identifying factors in the New Testament church. And I have shown you those in about four minutes. And if you were to go and read the book of Acts, and you were to read the first 19 chapters of Acts, depending on how fast of a reader you are, you could probably read all 19 chapters in, in, in 15 minutes, or maybe, maybe it'll take you an hour, I don't know. It depends on how fast you read. But do you realize that those 19 chapters cover almost 25 years of time? This wasn't a few moments of history. This was 25 years of consistent identifying factors. In those four examples, we find Peter preaching the message. We find Philip preaching the message. We find Paul preaching the same message within 25 years. All identifying factors. And I want to tell you, identifying factors will always stand the test of time. They will always stand the test of time. Here we are over 2,000 years later, and Point Church has a single mission. Jesus, just like the book of Acts, we believe Jesus is the Messiah, and Jesus is the answer for the world today. Our mission is to point people to the King, point this community to the Savior, point this world to Jesus, and we still believe in the same identifying factors of the early church. We still preach and teach the same identifying factors. Today in this room, today online, you too can believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And you can put action to your words. You can repent of your sins, as Acts 2.38 says. You can be baptized with the precious name of Jesus. You can be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, with evidence of speaking in tongues. Identifying factors. Over the past two weeks, I've been preaching about identity. What I believe God wants me to clarify today is, is simply this. In our personal identity as well as the church... The enemy constantly tries to dilute our identity. If he can remove certain identifying factors, he creates confusion. If he can change certain identifying factors, he can negatively impact a child of God and the church of God. So he tries to dilute identity. He attacks identity. He creates confusion in identity. And today God has sent me with a simple word for this church. Often in our attempt to protect certain aspects of our identity, we unknowingly forget other aspects of our identity. So I want to show you one. In Matthew 4, at the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus, the first reference he makes to his very first disciples is this. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water. For they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and they followed him. From the very beginning, an identifying factor of being a follower of Jesus was that you would reach for others. In Matthew 28, after the resurrection, Jesus made it very clear again in Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And I love this scripture because in three verses, he solidifies three major identifying factors of the New Testament church. First, he identifies the New Testament church will be about reaching for others. Next, he identifies they must baptize everyone in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And in this single scripture, he solidifies who he is. Paul later showed it in Colossians 2 and 9, for in Christ lives all 
the fullness of God in a human body. When we baptize in Jesus' name, we are baptizing in the fullness of who God is. We are baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit because Jesus encompasses it all. He made it clear when he spoke about his name. And finally, in these scriptures, he identifies that the New Testament church will teach disciples to obey all the commands he has given. We're talking about identifying factors. But my charge to the church today is we can't look at all this and then dilute those identifying factors. We can't pick and choose which ones we identify with. It's all or it's nothing in the kingdom of God. It's all or nothing. And often we get on board with teaching and preaching who Jesus is. And we love the Acts 2.38 message, as many of you here today have put action to those words yourself. You believe who Jesus is. You, you have repented. You, you might have been baptized in Jesus' name and received the Holy Ghost. But the identity of the early church didn't stop there. In Acts 1 and 8, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. An identifying factor is we have power to overcome things in this world. We have power to overcome the struggles in life. And it continues, because we love that one. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Listen to me today. We can't dilute the identity of the church by forgetting to be his witness. We can't. It's our charge to be fishers of men. Point to yourself just for a moment in this room. It's our charge to be witnesses of Jesus. We can't say we're an apostolic church without being apostolic in all of our identity. And the apostles did more than believe in Jesus. They did more than preach baptism in Jesus' name. And they did all those things. I showed it. They did more than speak with other tongues. And they did that. I showed it. But the apostles were witnesses to this world. They preached the gospel and they spread the goodness of God. If we could stand in this place today. The enemy attacks the church by diluting its identifying factors. When you are struggling with who you are, you rarely ever do what you were created to do. And so he tries to stop the church from being the church by diluting who they are. Loss of identity equals loss of effectiveness. Jesus likened one of the primary factors of the identity of the New Testament church to the process of fishing. Here in Louisiana, sportsman's paradise, fishing is a big thing. If you know fishing, you know that there are big moments that you can capitalize on to catch the most fish. These moments may change with the season, they change with the location, they change with the type of fish. But they all have big moments you can capitalize on. They say, I, I had to ask, they tell me, freshwater fish spawn when water temperatures go down to certain temperatures. Bass spawn when water temps hit 65 degrees. Sakale, my favorite, spawns when wash, water temperature is between 60 and 65 degrees. Location matters when you're fishing. Finding the right spot can mean the difference between a good day or a bad day. So fishers seek for the best spots. Mornings and evenings are normally better than midday. So time plays a part. And today I'm trying to use these examples to re-energize this church. To solidify its identity as an apostolic church. We can't call ourselves a Book of Acts church if we forget one of the primary identifiers of the Book of Acts church. And that is simply spreading the good news of Jesus. Becoming fishers of men. Listen closely. Each of you are called to be a witness of Jesus. Everyone in this room, everyone under the sound of my voice online, you are called to be a witness of Jesus. It's not just the preacher's task. It's not just the pastor's task. It is for all followers of Jesus. I believe in my heart that your next level is going to come when you go back to the basics. 
I believe that your blessings will come when you go back to the identifying factors of the body of Christ. I believe that miracles will come when we refocus our efforts on doing the mission that God has called us to do. I believe our watch this moment is waiting on us to cast the bait, cast the bait out into this world. In two weeks it is Easter Sunday. Perhaps the greatest opportunity each year for unchurched people to attend church is Easter Sunday. In two weeks, the water temperature is going to be just right. The location will be just right. The church, they all go to church on Easter Sunday. The timing will be just right. It's Easter Sunday. We can cast the bait and reconnect to one of the most important identifying factors of the church of the living God. As you leave today, there's going to be these invite cards in the foyer. We're going to have them there going forward. They say different things. They're going to continue saying different things to keep it fresh. But I encourage someone today, make a commitment that you will do what we are all called to do. And that is cast the bait to a friend, cast the bait to a family member, cast the bait to someone who you work with, someone who you go to school with, cast the bait. At this point, I'm wondering if we could all gather to the front. I know this message is a little different than what I normally preach, but God really put it on my heart for this specific Sunday. I'm going to pray over each of you. And here's, what I, here's my point. I've read this scripture a whole bunch of times in Ephesians. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I believe that part of that plan is that there are people that God has placed in your circle. Let me tell you something. Your relevance to the kingdom of God is often who God has placed in your circle. They're placed there because you were called and are meant to spread the good news of Jesus to that person. And I believe if we will reconnect to our purpose and realize that our identity matters and what we do matters, we will step into those good things that God has planned long ago. So right now, I want to pray over every single one of you in this place that God will open your eyes to those good things that he has planned for you long ago. If you'll lift your hands, I believe God wants to, to, to anoint some people here today. I believe he wants to open doors for some people here today. I believe he wants to, 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 to open some, give clarity to some people here today right now on this calling for them. And he's about to use you to be an identifying factor, to have a watch this moment, to step into your calling that God has called you to do. Lift your hands up right now in the name of Jesus, I pray for every single person under the sound of my voice, God, that you will anoint them, speak to them, God, that you will position people in their lives perfectly over the next two weeks, God, and that you will show them with clarity, this is that moment they're supposed to cast the bait. This is that moment they're supposed to do what you call them to do. This is a watch this moment. This is the moment that they are identifying as the apostolic church, the early church, the church of the living God. And, and, and maybe you haven't been baptized in Jesus' name yet. Maybe you have not yet been filled with the Holy Ghost. Maybe you've never repented of your sins. Maybe you don't even, don't even really know who Jesus is. You don't even know who this man is that you're supposed to believe in. I want to tell you that Jesus can meet you right here, right now, and he can change your life. He can step into your situation, and he can change your life. It's a simple thing. All we have to do is step up and say, God, I believe that you're my Savior. You're my King. And the Lord, I repent right now of my sins. I turn to 
towards you, Lord God. I'm, I'm removing the things in my life that are holding me back. And in this place, we can baptize you in Jesus' name. And God can fill you with the Holy Ghost, with evidence of speaking in other tongues in this place right now. So if you have a need, if you need that right now, let go ahead and lift your hands. And then for others, if you have a need, go ahead and lift your hands. I want to pray one more time. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see every need, God. You see every situation, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name, God, that you will fall down, step into their situation. Let the Holy Ghost fall in their life in the name of Jesus right now, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Grace like water. Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you can download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon. 